Mike, what can we learn about normal brain function from brain impairment? Well, that's a, that's a massively complicated <laughs> question, Robert, but we can, we can, I can say a few things about it that are, that are obvious. First of all, we can, there, are, there are a variety of ways that we can challenge a brain. You could say, well, we, first of all, we can examine how a brain changes, obviously, uh, as, as an impairment or as a disability or as a, a neurological or a psychiatric disease progresses. And in parallel, we can look at how the physiology of the brain, how the activities in the brain, how the brain organizes its activities change. And this is very informative about us. It basically gives us another look about the, the machine and its operations. I mean, if you look at the machine operating in its normal way, and then you look at it op op operating in an abnormal way, and, and it's very valuable to see it progress in its abnormal sense mm. from something more normal to something very abnormal. You begin to understand you begin to see a series of implications from the abnormalities that relate to the normal. In my day, ancient brain science, the way that it was done is you'd, you'd, you'd uh, extirpate some part of the brain of, of an animal, a cat or whatever you were working on, and, and see what function was lost. Uh, well, that was very we, we've done many such experiments <laughs> in humans uh, where, we had a, where there's a necessity to extirpate, where there's a necessity to remove a disease that injured an evil source of activity. Uh, there are also many experiments... Well, it, could be a, it could be a brain tumor, it could be a, 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 a stroke situation, it can be epilepsy, I guess, is right. one of the most important. Right, right. And epilepsy is a common, uh, a common reason to record from brains and, and also to extirpate uh, little pieces of brain, ho hopefully limited pieces, because we have to basically control the activity that's raging through the brain that is the source of the pathology in the individual, that, that is the source of their suffering. One of the advantages this is given to scientists is that they've been able to actually go into those operating theaters with, of course, the permission of the patient and record from little pieces of brain that are going to be extirpated or that are going to be in the field of view of the surgery that, in which recording can be done in a way oh. that, 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 that can't harm the brain. Mm. So there, we've learned a lot about fundamental brain processes increasingly from the human brain yeah. by directly monitoring, by directly controlling yeah. its, its re, uh, recording its responses and by, by looking at the consequences of things like limited and controlled and defined extirpation. So let's take some specific examples of uh, where we have a brain injury that we've, we've learned something about brain function. Well, our wonderful set of contemporary experiments in where the person, or the patient has a aggressive brain tumor that will require a surgical excision of brain tissue. And these are brain these are fast growing aggressive right. tumors that the surgeon there, a source of great hazard and danger to the patient. And a common, a, a effective strategy is to try to define an interesting uh, con con contributor to a, to, a, to a specific interesting behavior or an action, the control of action, near the tumor. Mm. And, and then with the patient's permission, in a way that won't harm the patient, basically that, that within the operating theater, within the time of the surgery, the activities of that can actually be documented directly. Mm -hmm. And that's a wonderful resource. It used to be that we could only do such experiments in, in, uh, in subhuman, sure. in, in, in prim other primates or in carnivores or rodents or other other species, and to be able to actually derive such data in humans is tremendously valuable. Well, what are the kinds of information we're learning from that, that well, we didn't know before? We're learning how that little piece of tissue, that, that, that contributor, that contributing source, mm. is playing its part, its role, in, the, in controlling the operations or in, or in controlling the plasticity that governs the operations of, of that, that particular behavior. And we looked at many behaviors like this. Let me cite another example for you, and there are many examples like this as well. So I could learn a lot about the basic powerful plasticity of the brain if I could, if I could deliver an input in a new form into one of the great sensory systems of the brain, right? I mean, that would be a wonderful experiment if I could just perform it in a human. How would the brain of the human adjust to that? Mm. What would it do with it? Well, the experiment's been done. You know, historically in my laboratory, a research scientist uh, working with me developed a cochlear implant which is an artificial electrical stimulation device that gets implanted in the inner ear of a person that's profoundly deaf. The person mm -hmm. hears nothing, mm -hmm. and basically it is designed to shock the auditory nerve 
to deliver input into the brain that can simulate the input that's normally delivered by speech so that now speech, oral speech, can be understood by the person again, yeah, so they can recover their speech and language. absolutely remarkable. They work. They work. They're wonderful devices. Most people that receive them recover the ability to operate in language. And they can talk to you with, on the telephone. They can talk to you with their back turned to you. They, have, they recover the ability to understand what you're saying. But my tiny point is, is that the information delivered by these devices is necessarily very crude. Sure. You know, the normal input is very sophisticated. It's refined. It's elaborate. It's wonderful, right? Scientists, for a long time, looked at all of those details and imagined that all of those details really mattered. Now I take a device that shocks the auditory nerve. It's a little bit akin to playing Chopin with your forearms, (laughs) you know? I developed a very crude, very unintelligible form of speech. I ask the person when the device is turned on, what do you hear? And they say... It sounds like crap. It sounds like noise. It sounds like somebody speaking a language that I've never heard before. It sounds like a robot, right? Three or four or five or six or seven or eight months later, they hear everything. Now, that's not, that's not a product of marvelous engineering. I mean, the engineering is good on these devices and the several places from which these devices can't come. It's a, it's the, 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 the benefits have to be attributed to the, to the incredible power of the brain to adapt, to create a new construct of the details of language that's just as useful as the old one. Now, when that occurs, a wonderful thing happens. The wonderful thing that happens is, is that now that it's clearly, unequivocally constructed, a representation of the native language, the operational language of the person in a new form, you could ask the simple question, well... This person per- heard before. They learned things in the language that they operated in before. They have all of this massive stored information. They've learned all about the relationships of language from their long history of language. How on earth can they have a unified, simple connection to all of that information? How can they account for that, right? <laughs> the only way you can account for it is if all of that resident information, all of that resident processing participated in the reconstruction of the new language representation. That's Mm. the only way you can account for it. Not by just accessing. So uh, just by by such a manipulation, that is to say by delivering into an inner ear information in a new form, I can come to powerful conclusions about how the brain organizes an activity. I know that it's using the incredibly powerful, you could say, top-down processes from all of the stored information to contribute to the organization of a new form of a decoder that takes this new trash and turns it into gold and then connects it seamlessly to all of this information about it, right? Now, this is a powerful self-organizing machine, and it's using incredible resources from the bottom, up from the bottom, and down from the top to organize its behaviors. So we learn a lot. We learn a tremendous amount from studying models of brains, from models of systems in humans that aren't quite right, you could say, are reconstructed, reestablished function of behavior, or that are variously wounded, or that are slowly deteriorating. Because by studying those models, we always gain information, always gain a new insight, a new look, a new peek into the operation of the machine in its normal, normal operations. So, Robert, there's another really interesting aspect of how the brain uh, re- reestablishes a, a valid and useful representation of language. Uh, uh, at one point in studying these patients with these early cochlear implant device models, I put one of these patients into a sound room, a sound shielded room, and I told them that I was going to deliver a word list to them across the microphone. So they're listening to the sounds of these words across their cochlear implant. And I asked them, to simply repeat to the best of their ability each thing they heard to, 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 to pr- reproduce it with their own voice. So I, began, I gave them these long word lists, and my notion was is that I'd record the, the distorted things I heard and try to understand how I had to correct the translation mm. in, in encoding this, the speech in the auditory nerve array. So they, I would give them a word, I would say something like this, and I would say the, mm. is, and they'd say eh. A, they might say, eh, list, and they'd say, eh. I spent many hours trying to interpret this mess. Maybe the third or fourth day, it occurred to me to do the experiment in an, in an alternate way. 
I gave the cochlear implant patient the volunteer, the list. And I said, now read the list. And each time you read a word, listen carefully and try to reproduce it as well as you can with your own voice. So they read, this, this, is, is, a, a, list, list. Mm. It didn't take them very long to, to say, well, gee, if everyone else <laughs> just said it like I say it, I'd understand everything, right? <laughs> Not realizing that their brain is informing them that when they say it, what they hear is correct. It's a trick of the brain and an incredible resource for the brain to reconstruct a valid representation of speech from the hearing side. Because these were people who though became profoundly deaf originally had that sound. Exactly. They, they, knew, had they knew that, that were, those letters, L-I-S-T, that representation had a sound that they remembered. Absolutely. And they have this model. And they use this model, basically, to rapidly drive the new form of representation unified to it, to make the correction, to recreate a, rep a language system that is operational, that is functional again. This is a miracle of, of a self-organizing brain. And one other really interesting thing about these individuals is that when they recover their ability to understand what you say, they usually say, gee, Dr. Mersnick, it sounds just like it sounded, when my hearing was intact, yeah. it sounds perfectly natural, right? Which is decisively and decidedly a trick of the brain. It's informing them the speech in very different form, encoded in a radically, in a crude and radically different way, is perfectly natural. And that's the brain telling them that it's operational again. That's incredible. That's something that I could have never predicted. Yeah. Well, I didn't either. <laughs> I didn't either. But seeing things like this in front of you as a scientist and understanding their extended implications is one of the joys of science because you realize that by looking at this uh, unusual case, this pathology case, this case in which you're intervening in a specific way, it has powerful lessons that could have taken hundreds or thousands of experiments yeah. to tumble to, right? You challenge the brain in a way and see how it adapts to these very different forms of stimuli. What an experiment.